welcome to Real Film Snobs. I am Angela Yeager. I am joined again today by a special guest host, Chris Andreessen. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Angela. I'm really happy to be back. And Chris is uh, my fellow film festival goer. So um, Chris and I have been to a few fil film festivals together now. Let's see, you've been to Bend Film Festival a few times because mm -hmm. you went on your own one year. Right. We went together at once and then we right. went to Ashland Film Festival together. So, um, and our plan pre-COVID was to, you know, continue to go to film festivals together, but that's kind of been well, shot hopefully, down. Hopefully we can again. We've tried to do some virtual stuff together, but yeah, hopefully again. Yeah, and so since COVID, we've been watching film festivals virtually. I think you probably participated even more than I have. Um, yeah, I kind of, I went kind of yeah. deep. <laughs> you did Sundance and did you do Tribeca too or just I Sundance? didn't do Tribeca I did a couple I think I did New Fest through New York and um, I did a little bit of dipping my toe in with things like the Portland International Film Festival the Seattle oh. International Film Festival sometimes it was about trying to find a film I really wanted to see and who was showing it and so then I would stumble across a film festival that was showing something so I saw something through Las Cruces that way. So yeah, just little bits and bobs here and there. But I did do Ashland twice during COVID and a little bit of Bend. Um, and it's oh, interesting. I did Ashland as well. I forgot. <laughs> it was, that was in the spring, you know, five <laughs> whole months ago. <laughs> it's true. Well, and it's interesting to see because that one's happened now twice, how it has evolved and they've gotten better at doing virtual film festivals. So people have learned a lot for sure during COVID. That's true. I think the second year of Ashland was much better than the first year virtually. So mm -hmm. for sure. And so today we're going to uh, focus on a new film festival. It's actually an old film festival. It used to be called the Oregon State International Film Festival. And it's gradually going to be shifting into the DOS Film Festival, um, which is put on uh, by a professor of German film studies at, at Oregon State University. And he's created this nonprofit um, to really showcase international and um, independent films. And their hope is to make this an ongoing film festival um, going forward. So you can find out more about it at dosfilmfest.vhx.tv. And there should be a graphic up on the screen that shows that. So Das Film Fest kind of makes you think it might be German, but it's not actually a German film fest. It was all sorts of different movies. We decided we just randomly picked four, um, two each that we were each interested in kind of seeing based on the descriptions. So I'm going to review those for you today. Um, I don't know if any of these films are still available online. You can definitely check them, try to find them. If not, though, I would encourage people to seek out um, this film festival online and others like it because independent film festivals are really trying to find an audience um, through these, you know, streaming options. So it was very nice to be able to watch all of these online mm -hmm. via streaming. So um, we'll move right into this, uh, the first film, which is Welcome to Monterey. This is a documentary about a small town in Indiana that is fighting to stay alive as its population is decreasing as the young people move away and businesses close down. In fact, the town's population has gone down so much that it even it's uh, the, as the movie is starting, the local high school has now shuttered because there aren't enough students to keep it going. And so uh, they, uh, the town is contending with this, which is the, in the case of um, many small towns in America, particularly in areas like Indiana and the Midwest where the population has dwindled. So the film is really just kind of a slice of life type of documentary. It doesn't give you a political perspective as to why this might be happening or, you know, socio-political commentary of any kind. It's just very straight ahead, like here's some people in the town and what they think about things. Um, there was a movie that came out a few years ago called Monrovia, Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, by the great acclaimed documentary filmmaker Frederick Wiseman which is also has a similar themes, but unlike a master filmmaker like Frederick Wiseman, who really knows how to um, bring out without being heavy handed with any sort of socio-political content, really bring out some of the themes and areas. This one I found at times to be a little disjointed. Um, I was trying to figure out like, okay, you know, so, so, so the town is struggling and so what? You know, I was kind of like, where's the, where is this going? I'm curious what you thought, Chris. Yeah, I, I haven't seen Monrovia, but um, this this one, it was interesting because it reminded me a lot. My, my mother grew up in a very small town in uh, Colorado, northeastern Colorado, and it has gone through some similar kinds of things to this town just because young people move away and the, you know certain businesses go out of out of business and certain tragedies happen. Like I was sort of amazed that, you know, talking about like the gas station catching on fire and that bar that seemed like such a part of the community being left to just sort of fall down essentially um 
you know, it, it, it did remind me a lot of that. And I, you're right, it didn't really talk about sort of, uh, sort of the politics of maybe why that was happening. Although it did give us a little bit of insight into the small town politics, you know, with the city council and, and mm -hmm. sort of uh, the things around this particular event. I mean, I like that they focused it around this event and then kind of told you the story of the town around this annual event that they do and whether or not that even that annual event can continue. Like, do they have enough interest in people? I found the, I don't know what you call it, the coda, the sort of parts at the end where they talked about sort of who who did what after the film was made, kind of like who has passed away and who's now no longer on the council and who's no longer part of that event as sort of telling, you know, because it sort of gave you some insight into like, oh yeah, stuff continued to, in some ways deteriorate and change after, mm -hmm. you know, after the period of the film. But I really liked the historian who kind of, you know, stumbled into his role and then had book after book after book of history, family histories for that area. So there is something to be said for capturing it. But right. yeah, as a as a not film, commenting. Yeah, yeah, which I think is okay. I think that it, you're right. It does do a good job of that. And I, I did think it was funny. It's all building up to this big Labor Day parade, right? Which right, is like the town's right. big event. Right. And boy, you know, I'm a city girl. I mean, I'm from Phoenix originally and I live in Salem now and Salem's not a big, big city, but it's it's a city compared to this place, especially. Right, and right. I really felt it in those moments when they showed the Labor Day parade and they're like, this is our big event. And I was like, oh my gosh, please. If that was the thing I had to look forward to all year, I'd be in big trouble. Well, and uh, for my mother, it was, it was the Harvest Festival festival and corn the corn festival you know things like that so yeah that totally felt and, and sometimes I like those little small town events but compared to like some of the cool events we have in the Salem area like maybe like Silverton or towns yeah. like that that have festivals and stuff this parade was rather sad yeah. I thought yeah. a little bit yeah. but, but kind uh, of sweet but and charming too like nostalgic you know it had a feeling of nostalgia for sure Libby has just decided that she needs to be oh. on camera so I'm going to show Libby just for a second okay, good job please, Libby okay. Yeah, she decides she needs to be a star. <laughs> so yeah, I can recommend this one though. I actually thought this one was well shot and overall mm -hmm. well made. And I think it keeps your interest. I was interested to see sort of what was the next thing they were gonna highlight and where it was gonna go. So I found it compelling for sure. Yeah, okay, Libby. Libby is uh, trying to knock my computer down. So that's <laughs> super fun. This is the, the joys of taping via Zoom. <laughs> Oh, funny. All yeah, right. You've so, got the next movie. so yeah, I have the next uh, film, which is called, I have to look at it because it's a long title, Cryptopia, Bitcoin, Blockchains, and the Future of the Internet. Um, I picked this film. I didn't really read the description, so I may have failed in my first task, but I picked it by the title because I just don't understand Bitcoin. Me and, too. I'm the same way as you. I don't get it at all. <laughs> and this whole blockchain thing, I was like, that's a whole nother thing I don't understand. And the internet, I feel like I get it, but you know, what's the future of the So that's why I picked it. But this was probably not the film to do that. I think the, the guy who made the film, Torsten Hoffman, made a film five years ago called um, Bitcoin, the end of money as we know it. And I feel like that film probably would have explained more to me about what is Bitcoin. But this one does give you a little bit of a primer. Um, but the but essentially what it's trying to do is say that uh, Bitcoin is not really that different from modern banking because we don't have gold uh, shoring up the value of our dollars anyway. And so dollars are being printed with nothing underlying their value. So even our dollars in some ways are similar to Bitcoin. They're just numbers and databases. And we're we're honoring that value and we transfer those, you know, bits of data from our banks to our bill people, to our mortgages, to whatever, but we're not actually giving dollars most of the time to people. And so I appreciated that kind of analogy. That helped me conceptualize Bitcoin a little bit more. Um, and I also appreciated um some of the people in the in the film, the one guy in particular, I can't think of his name right now, but he's he's um, the head of one of the kind of protective because there's a lot of protection around Bitcoin too, um, and uh, he was talking about you know your biggest mistake would be to put money into Bitcoin that you can't lose. And then your second biggest mistake would not to be have any money in Bitcoin. And that was sort of a helpful way of conceptualizing it a little bit for me. And he sort of said, you know, if you could put in the amount of money you might spend, he used like a romantic weekend with your spouse, 
And I was thinking, well, romantic weekend with my spouse, I don't have a spouse, but might be like $400. Is he thinking like $4,000? I don't have any sense of his sense of scale for yeah, a romantic, romantic weekend. weekend. might be like going to, you know. Right, it's a private island. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if he's a rich guy. Yeah, exactly. First it's not like one like night in a hotel. A bed and breakfast in Oregon, you know, something, you know. A little right, bit. So I was like, well, could I get in for like $400? You know, anyway, so it did, it did start to make me think about sort of how, if I was going to try to do it, I might think about it. I start to understand how, okay, there was Bitcoin and now there's all this other stuff like Dogecoin they keep talking about, although that was not talked about in this movie, but they talked about other alternative currencies to Bitcoin. It was fascinating. Um, and at the end, so the, essentially what they're saying is, you know, these blockchains, which could also be used by industry, could make certain processes faster, better, cheaper, because they won't, they exist outside of governments. Uh, and things like that. And that eventually we might be able to create a new internet or web 3.0 where, you know, we're not paying through ads and we're not being tracked. And so I suppose there is a crypto utopia, which is the phrase that this film is sort of based around that could be possible. Although the film spends all this time talking about how even the original kinds of processes have been either thwarted or corrupted or changed or whatever. And it's hard to think like, well, why would that not keep happening? So anyway, right. Angela, what did you think? We still have these kind of malev these not so great forces mm -hmm. doing things to it, including tracking, right? Because the whole point of it was like, oh, don't track the money. And then, oh, well, then they need anyway. I found it very confusing. I'm not a finance person. And I, the, my favorite part of the movie was actually at the beginning where he shows the clip of John Oliver saying, oh. hey, Bitcoin, everything you don't understand about finances combined with everything you don't understand about the internet. Right. And I thought, oh yeah, that's why I don't understand it. That's probably what we should have watched was that clip maybe. That I just felt like I should just watch the John Oliver episode on it. And he'll probably <laughs> explain it better and shorter with less creepy people. Cause a lot of these guys in this movie seem like creeps. They're trying to tell you that they're not creeps and that they're people that are about democracy and freedom but a part of you is thinking i think you're kind of a creep so um or at least a little that, bit like uh withholding in terms of information so it makes them feel feel a little bit sketchy you're like sketchy yeah maybe yeah. that's a better word than yeah creep, but i mean a little bit <laughs> negative but yeah uh, but i'm going with that so there's some creepy but, people i agree but yeah yeah including maybe the filmmaker himself but that's a whole other <laughs> thing so well i you know i thought the movie was going to be a little bit more skeptical of bitcoin than it actually was and so it actually is fairly, I mean, I think it's even handed to a certain degree, but it also, I think overall is maybe pro on the pro side. I think that the idea of getting money mm -hmm. outside of governments <clears throat> is interesting, right? I think that's what the people that initiated this were trying to go for. And I thought that was sort of an interesting concept. I think the way that they're trying to frame anyone who's trying to put regulation around it is sort of like um, destroying it. You know, they talk about how the US government that you've got these senators and people trying to put regulations on these things. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's probably also some good reasons for some of that. Um, and like the regulation on the internet, which might be just trying to help corporations. I think some of this, they talk about that some of these people got busted for instance, for doing some things with Bitcoin because it's money that can't be quote unquote tracked. You could buy, illegal things with it right mm -hmm. i mean that's sort of some of the ideas with it so um although it turns out that they actually could track it when it yeah came it feels down like it's it, right? actually super tracked you know in some ways that it seems like it's supposed to exist out there kind of in an untracked way but it seems like it's very tracked although because it's all databases right yeah, it has to exist yeah. somewhere i mean yeah. unlike physical cash which is a paper product which still can be tracked as well in a way but if you think about mm -hmm. it if something lives somewhere in a computer somewhere in a database somewhere someone can track it right um i mean i don't know that but i mean i'm not a tech person yeah. so maybe but i think about my online like, banking that's just a database too so it's sort of like is all money a database is what i came out of this of this uh, film yeah. thinking like you know except for the few dollars i have in my wallet is not everything just databases talking to other well databases. that's what they pointed out that most of our money isn't real anyway i mean mm -hmm. it's all just spreadsheets and computers anyway it's mm -hmm. not backed up with any physical real gold or product right most of our real money and it's a real quote unquote and so right. bitcoin isn't any different but the idea is that you know who backs it then it's right. ultimately because like right now if someone hacks your you know your account and you have your, you know, what partially what you're paying for with the credit cards and all these companies, right? Is that if something protection. happened, you have protection. Right. 
this sort of with Bitcoin, you think that doesn't exist, but then you think, um, but also you think, well, then you're not paying these fees, right? For someone to mm -hmm. maintain those accounts for you. I think that's sort right. of the idea, but someone's making money off this stuff still. For sure. I mean, sure. I mean those wealthy. people who have those computers that do the mining, I still don't understand the mining aspect of it, but those no, are they tried to explain mining money. and I didn't get that at all. I didn't get yeah. the mining. I almost need like a whole separate movie on that. Although I don't well, know if I care they get, enough to. <laughs> that's true because they get Bitcoin for it. I think that's where they make money. Plus, uh, of course, those companies that have created alternate bitcoins have certainly figured out a way to make it speculative yeah. and it's all I very did, i did appreciate though the very early on the point because it was like yeah why is this the case like banks won't won't transfer money on a weekend and after five you know it's sort of like why why is banking still existing in kind of a brick and mortar world you know because they were saying you know bitcoin is sort of outside of weird strangely imposed structures, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, why, why is anything sort of still on a Monday to Friday, eight to five kind of system? So it made some good points. Sleep. I like, I liked the. That's what I thought part. when I saw that people need to, there's still people involved with this, not just computers. But it's online too, you know, like if I'm going to transfer yeah. money to somebody in Bolivia on a Saturday, why does it take till, you know, halfway through the next week or something for something to happen when it's really mostly one database talking to another, but who knows? Anyway, that's my personal gripe. This is really necessary about the film. Um, I liked the guy. Um, I do think he is pro Bitcoin uh, and I am kind of interested to watch the first film. I think that that will probably help illuminate this film. Uh, and yeah. I did watch this one twice. The first time it was too, it went over my head. I was like, oh my God, I, it's like oh, going to school a little bit. I don't think I could watch it twice. I just, well, you know, we we're going to talk about it today. So that's another reason to watch it more than once. Yeah. But. <laughs> well, I would recommend it. I think for people that are interested, I think maybe people that already know a little bit about it and want to go more mm -hmm. deeply into it. Because for me as a primer, like you said, I'm not sure it worked because I was confused mm -hmm. probably within 20 minutes. I was like, oh no, I'm already lost. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there is that, but yeah. yeah. Definitely okay. an interesting mix of movies. So we'll move on. It's to the true. Next we have, I mean, we're definitely all over the place in terms of types of movies. So then my next film is a, a narrative feature called Motivation. And the tagline on the poster that was uh, on the page was like, one motivational speaker, one recreational vehicle, zero experience, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cute. And it's probably the reason I picked it. Um, it was a comedy. It is a comedy. And it's, uh, it, it's got some funny moments. Um, it was written by the main actor, uh, Angus Benfield. Uh, okay. Interestingly, I looked it up on IMDb and no one is listed as the director. <laughs> there's a first AD and a second AD and there's a director of photography, but there's no one who's listed as the director of the film unless I've completely missed it, which oh, okay. in some ways I thought, maybe that's my complaint that there wasn't a director of this film. But um, anyway, the it's a cute film. It's not a great film. I mean, it, it feels a lot like a self-help book put on film um, because it talks a lot about, you know, finding happiness, um, go write your own story, other things I wrote, choose joy in the new instead of searching for what may be. I mean, these are the kinds of lines that were that were coming fast and furious. So it's also kind um, of making fun of that too, though, which I liked. Yeah, but it felt more pro it than con it I don't I would have liked it if it was more skeptical and maybe a little bit more maybe ironic or or sarcastic it was a little almost too sweet for my take and some of the slapstick physical humor and the kind of sound effects of that like that boing, 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 you know kind of stuff if you hit somebody and then the kind of like I, I was yeah. not game for that part of it so what did you think yeah, I mean, I would agree. It's a very, it's a silly little movie. It's a very, end of, it's obviously very independent. I thought the mm -hmm. main character that he was good, though, I thought he, you know, portrayed his character well. He's kind of this, he's a janitor, mm -hmm. you know, in this building. And um, when his brother, um, you know, passes away unexpectedly, he ends up taking over his brother's self-help business. Mm -hmm. And his brother was a mo motivational speaker, uh, motivational, not motivational, right. motivational. <laughs> and so he goes, you know, he tries to take it over, but he doesn't know what he's doing at first because he, he's having a hard time being a motivational speaker because he doesn't have any motivation himself and he's mm -hmm. um, struggling. Of course, there's a love interest and she um, runs the local business in town that's being taken over by the bad guys. And, and you know, the story is very um, kind of cliche. You know, it reminded me of a little bit, um, like a much worse version. I mean, I'm forgetting the movie right now, Chris, but the one we saw at the Ashland Film Festival that ended up being like the one filmed in the Ashland area that was the big breakout movie oh, that year. And that the it pizza ended up place. Right. It was about um, 
the town of Phoenix, right? Yeah. So Phoenix, Oregon. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit of that, a little bit, but like a much chintzier, less well acted version of that film. Mm-hmm. And that you had kind of this like quirky people. What it didn't mm-hmm. have that that movie had was good like atmosphere. Like it could have been just filmed anywhere. Maybe it was filmed in LA. I don't know, but it didn't mm-hmm. get a sense of like the community like you did with Phoenix, Oregon, where you felt like you know, you got a sense of the community and the people and all of that, uh, even though it was actually, I don't think filmed in Phoenix, Oregon, but neither here nor there. Yeah, so, yeah, right. right. Um, and it was filmed in Southern Oregon. So you get an idea of the atmosphere, at least, whereas this film was sort of like that kind of generic, like- And even the motorhome didn't feature very much in it. Like I kept thinking like motivation, what about the motor part? What happened to motor? I, thought I mean, it was, was on the sign on his yeah, car, he but- He lived there, but he didn't go anywhere in it, which yeah. maybe itself was a, but I thought he was going to like travel. I thought the story right. was going to go in a different direction than it did right. fun, featuring the love story, which I could care less about I thought it would have been much funnier I was like rewriting the script in my head like oh he's trying to like go on the like the funniest scenes are the scenes where he goes into places and he's trying to do the motivational speaker Mm -hmm. thing and it's just failing and everyone's just sitting there like when he goes into the school Mm -hmm. and he's trying to do the motivational speech and he does like a karate chop up like kick and you know like yeah you can do it and they're all just looking at him like what is wrong with this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the funniest scenes to me because it reminds me of those like weirdos that would come to your school as like the guest speaker, and you're just like, wow, this person doesn't have anything going on in their life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> life goals not to end up like this guy, you know. So that's so I think I wish they kind of gone more in that direction with it. Yeah, it's true because like, he just kind of fumble through and bumble into sometimes motivational stuff to say. You know, it's like, right. oh, I actually said something by mistake that was good. Right, right. So. I think that that should have been where it went instead. So I can't recommend this one. Uh, it's like a two star movie but I think it had some like you know some sweet elements I it didn't bother me to watch it it's short enough you know that it yeah. kind of just kept going so yeah well and I liked it better when I realized that he wrote it because I thought okay well then there's a sort of earnestness there that I can appreciate you know and support it definitely felt like a, a labor of love type movie yeah. you could tell that they were just like oh we're gonna you know use yeah. these various people and yeah, yeah. so not yeah. a big budget no um <laughs> so we'll move on to our next movie which is an italian movie uh a newer film from 2020 or 2021 called mm-hmm. i married my mother which sounds really creepy but it's not creepy actually like the title implies i thought oh boy what are we getting ourselves into with this mm-hmm. it's about a man who finds a love lover love letters from his father to his mother um, as he's cleaning out her home um, as she's being put into like a nursing home and then um, decides to use them to connect with his mother who now has Alzheimer's and is, you know, quickly sort of, you know, losing um, connection with the present and, and with her memory and everything. And at the same time, he is marriage is failing um, and he has discovered possibilities with a, a woman, a nurse who works at the nursing facility that his mother is in. And so they, he decides to put on a production, a play reenacting his mother's old love letters where he's playing his father and then this woman who works in the nursing home is going to play his mother so that's the i married my mother part mm-hmm. so um of the film so um yeah i thought this one this was interesting i really liked some of the parts of the central premise of the movie and i thought compared to some of the other ones we watched it was pretty well acted i think the um the issue i had with this one is the way the wife was portrayed she is mm-hmm. so evil yeah, the beginning of the movie, I thought, why would you even be, this is like the mother of your children. Like she's mm-hmm. so awful to his mother and not understanding at all of the Alzheimer's situation, just really, really awful. And then she does like a total kind of about, you know, kind of a 180 towards the end of the movie that seemed to come from nowhere. Like all of a sudden they were like, oh, wow, we really demonize this woman. Let's make, try to make her sympathetic now. Well, and did you think it was like, cause it was because the other woman seemed to have interest in him and therefore he's interesting to someone else. So therefore he should be interesting again to her. I mean, I couldn't figure out why I was trying to understand why. Yeah, that's the only thing I could figure out is that she, you know, because she's obviously cheating on him. That's not giving too mm-hmm. much away of the movie. His mm-hmm. wife's cheating on him. And then all of a sudden the she sees him as more interesting once he, you know, gets involved in this play and the, the other woman is interested in him. But um, the, of course, the new woman is much, you know, more positive and younger and attractive. And I don't know, that just annoyed me. I really liked the relationship between him and his mother. And I thought the woman who played his mother was actually a really good actress, especially for kind of a low budget type movie like this. I thought she was very effective. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that part of it, I liked. And the idea of trying to connect with your parent on a level of trying to, there was find that spark left in her, in her memory. Um, I really liked that part of it, but I, I, it really bothered me how much they demonized the wife. I I just felt like that was unnecessary. It it seems like an old cliche in order for him to rekindle or get something going with this new woman. They had to like demonize his wife to justify his behavior, I think. 
Well, and I did sort of wonder, like, is it the way the actress chose to play it or was, was it the way that the words, I mean, I haven't, I didn't watch it more than once to sort of try to determine if it's the words she's saying or the way she's saying the words that made it seem so extra cruel, you know? So some of it might be choices, I guess she made as an actor, but. Well, um, she's pretty awful towards his mother though. When he's yeah, that like, was you pretty know, awful. When his sure. Yeah. I mean, she says horrible things to the mother when he's not around mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, she is not able to talk anymore because she becomes nonverbal at one point, even though right. she can still hear and listen, she's mm -hmm. nonverbal. And then the wife says horrible things to her knowing she's really horrible things. Them. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, well, like, she's evil. Like that's what I thought at that point. So yeah, I, anyway. I, I had a, I found it a little off putting in the sort of melodramatic moments of it. Like there's, you know, like when the it's ambulance the person top. goes, Alzheimer's and it kind of goes into slow motion and dramatic music and you know or like even when his mother's uh at the end you know there's some stuff with like visuals of time passing and clock stopping and things like that that I thought oh geez okay so some of that stuff was a little bit frustrating to me but I think I think like you overall you know you could appreciate the sort of setup especially with the letters yeah. and and I kept trying to figure out like is was is this about his father or this other person she almost married you know there were some in interesting things there yeah. to be honest it made me think of uh, Dick Johnson is dead only in that oh, that's so such a better, better film but it does some of the same things right you know sort of grappling with the loss of mm -hmm. a parent and their memory um but in a very different kind of way yeah, you brought um, that movie up I just want to watch that movie so I know such a good movie. I know so I don't want to not recommend this one but for sure Dick Johnson and dead is probably the better of the two oh yeah big tackling time, big a similar time. And kind that's of also a documentary sort of mm -hmm. kind of but a do, you know real people so mm -hmm. and where he's actually going through the memory loss and everything so it's really difficult but I can't yeah. recommend this one just barely yeah. so yeah I, I think would say out of out of all of them which is the film that you would recommend the most would you say Oh, probably, well, actually, maybe Welcome to Monterey, just because I found it interesting and compelling. I, the Bitcoin thing, I think if you're willing to watch two movies, <laughs> you know, if, you're, one. if you go back and watch the first one, which I haven't watched yet, and maybe this one, maybe as a pair, they are, you know, extra compelling. Uh, yeah, but yeah, for sure, welcome. I think you and I should watch the John Oliver episode on Bitcoin. For sure. Because <laughs> I feel like I need the background before I can start because this one goes really deep, like you said, on the mining and all that. And I thought, oh, I'm lost. I need I need the primer of the primer, apparently, because I thought this movie was going to be a primer. But I, I that's think what I, need, I thought. I, was I like, need a step before that. So yeah, yeah I think in the first couple of minutes, it was like, uh oh, not not great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How about okay, you? What well, do you recommend? Is that you? Which one is yours? I think uh, probably Welcome to Monterey is my top one, followed by I Married My Mother, you mm -hmm. know, for a fictional pick for sure. Yeah. yeah. So definitely looking forward to future films at the Dallas Film Festival. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just looking forward in general to hopefully you can keep me, you're good at looking up these film festivals, Chris, so hopefully more, more virtual and maybe someday in person film festivals That's to right. come for both of us. So. It's nice. It's nice that it's, you know, there's some options while we wait for that time, right? Right, right, mm -hmm. exactly. It's nice to have some options. And particularly things like Sundance and ones you were watching, ones that you probably wouldn't go to in person, quite right. honestly, you know, right. because, um, you know, you can't go everywhere. You travel. Yes, mm -hmm. you can't be everywhere. So it's mm -hmm. true. So thank you, Chris, again, for joining me on the show. As always, this is uh, realfilmsnobs.com is our website. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, um, you subscribe on YouTube by hitting that little bell and subscribe to our channel and you'll get updated when new episodes are posted. We're on CC Media, Scan TV in Silverton, Corvallis Access Media. KMUZ Radio and KMWV Radio. Uh, as always, thank you to our fantastic crew in Absentia, but especially Brad Wartman for taping the show, our fantastic sponsors for continuing to support the show, to my wonderful guest host, Chris Andreessen, for joining me. Thank you very much. Have a great day and great movies. Thank you, Angela. Thank you.